You are welcome, sir. Thank you, Pastor. Everybody, praise the Lord. Everybody, Cameroon, I said, praise the Lord. Father, we thank you today. We bless your name. Thank you for the commitment and consecration of your people. Thank you for this global service. Thank you, Lord, for the patience of your people, even in the open air in the afternoon. Bless everyone, Lord. Let your word do good in every life. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Before you sit down, another Cameroon Global. Amen. God bless you. I say you will save a play. We have been talking about transforming grace. And we have been talking about the glory of God. We have been talking about moving from grace unto glory. And we have been looking at greater grace for greater exploits in ministry. Bringing everything together. This service we are talking about gracious transformation. Of godly travelers, we're travelers, we're traveling from here to there. We're strangers on earth, we're pilgrims on earth, we're traveling to heaven, and we maintain the grace of God and the godliness He has given. We are godly travelers for a glorious trans translation. We are waiting for the time when we are going to be translated from earth to heaven. That's the time of the rapture. Everything we have on earth, everything we do on earth, Every blessing we receive on earth. If we miss that final glorious translation, everything would have been in vain. That's why Jesus said, What shall it profit a man? What will it profit you? What will it profit me? If we gain the whole world and we lose our soul. So you want to turn away from whatever gift you have. Whatever opportunities you have. Whatever authority you have. And whatever place you hold on earth. You want to think about the future. About the glorious translation. That's what the Lord is bringing before us today. There is a gracious transformation. As we travel through a pilgrim journey. So we can enter into heaven at the glorious translation. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, I beseech you therefore, it says, we're brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In verse 2, it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. You belong to Christ, be ye transformed. You claim to be born again, be ye transformed. I'm saved and sanctified, be ye transformed. 
I'm a member of a Bible believing church being transformed. I identify with the body of Christ being transformed. I am sanctified and holy being transformed. I'm a worker. I am a minister. Be ye transformed by the renewing of the mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Matthew chapter 25, verse 13. In Matthew 25, verse 13, watch ye therefore. Disciples, watch ye therefore. Followers of Christ, watch ye therefore. Preachers of the gospel, watch ye therefore. Travelers on the way to heaven, watch ye therefore. When we're not watchful, we're careless. When we're not watchful, we turn our face, our eyes from our goal, from heaven. When we're not watchful, we tie ourselves down with things, mundane things of the world. What ye therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. And then in verse 14, it says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling. The kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country. Who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. A Christ, a Savior, a Lord, King of Kings, has traveled to heaven already. We are now following in his path. We are traveling. We are moving on. We are pilgrims and strangers in the world. Every day. As we move towards heaven, we leave more of the world behind us. At the point of conversion, we turned our backs against the world. The cross before me, the world behind me. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. You're facing one direction. No turning back, no looking back. Every day you leave more and more of the world behind you. As we get older, in the grace of God, get older, in the godliness he has given those who are born again. We leave more and more of the world behind us. Because we're traveling and we're going on to eternity. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. I'm reading here from verse 5. It says, By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Enoch translated. He had heard about Adam. He had heard about Eve. God created them. And God gave them the word. He breathed his breath on them. Eternal breath. Eternal life. He breathed into them. And man became a living soul. But he gave them a commandment. 
you must not eat and if you are not going to eat you cannot you must not you will not touch Adam and Eve did not set their gaze, their eyes, their focus on what the Lord had said. And so they sinned, they died. And God pronounced the death penalty upon the whole of humanity. But Enoch singled out himself he knew death everywhere death on everyone but he singled himself out show me a man that really wants to get to heaven show me a church that wants to take their people to heaven that individual singles himself out. Others may, I cannot. Show me a preacher, show me a minister that wants to preach the gospel that will transform lives and translate people to heaven. That preacher, that minister singles himself out. Whatever others preach, whatever others do, whatever direction others follow, Enoch singled himself out. He didn't say, I know everybody will die, so I'm going to die. He didn't say, everybody has gone the wrong way, so I'll follow and follow the wrong way. He didn't say, everybody is like that. How can I be different? A pilgrim, a traveler who is going to heaven has to be different from the multitude going to hell. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And he was not found. He was not found. There are places you cannot find a gracious, godly, glorious believer. Some people want to be found everywhere. They want to be appreciated everywhere. They want to be accepted everywhere. If you are going to get your heaven, there are places we will not find you. If you are going to get to glory, there are some inglorious places and some despicable places, and there are some earthly places we cannot find you. You are different, you are distinct, and it was not found. They looked for him everywhere. He was not found. Because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. That man was married. He pleased God. He had children. He pleased God. He had neighbors. He pleased God. He had uh, society people around. But he pleased God. He made up his mind. The God of creation that created me. The God of glory. I'm going to spend eternity with will be number one in my life. Whether others are pleased or they're not pleased. Whether they're happy or they're not happy. I can bear their frown. But I will please God. The people who are going to make it at the rapture 
They are not men pleasers. They are not women pleasers. They are not society pleasers. They are the people that have only one thing in view. I will please God. By the life you live, by the prayer you pray, by the direction you go, only one thing to please God. You have gracious transformation, you are a godly traveler, and you will have a glorious translation. Let somebody there shout, Amen. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the gracious transformation of guilty transgressors. Number two, the godly tra uh, travelers with growing thirst. Every day, Enoch lived. There was, there was a desire. He was thirsty for something. I want to make it on the final day. Every day a believer lives on earth. There is one desire. There is one thirst. I want to see God on the final day. And so the joys of this world will not carry him away. The pleasures of this world will not carry him away. All the bubbles and the mirage of life will not carry him away. He has a desire, a passion, a thirst to get to heaven. Number three, the glorious translation before the great tribulation. Look at number one. Number one is the gracious transformation of guilty transgressors. The Lord has to take the guilt away. You owe a debt you cannot pay. He paid the debt he did not owe. You owe that debt. You are guilty. You are condemned. And there is no way you can pay. And he paid the debt he did not owe. He paid your debt. So that he can take the guilt away from you. And take the condemnation away from you. And give you such a change in your life. Transformation in your life. That you go through life carrying the gratitude of a transformed soul. Look at three things we're looking at here. And number one is reconciliation and gracious transformation of sinners. Number two is the restoration and the gracious trans uh, transformation of backsliders. Number three is the repentance and gracious transformation of a city. Number one, the reconciliation and the gracious transformation of sinners. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 18, and all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. You are at enmity with God. You are black. He is whiter than snow. You are dark in darkness. Light is he. 
you were guilty and dishonest, but he is holy, pure, perfect. You turned your back on God. And now you need reconciliation. That the Lord turns you around. God does not change. His holiness does not change. His righteousness does not change. He will not change to get reconciled with you. You are the one to turn and to change and get reconciled to him. You don't want to change your mind. You are the one to change your character. You are the one to change the direction of your life. You are the one to regret and have remorse and repent. So that you will be reconciled to the holy God of heaven. And it's in Jesus Christ. That as we repent and believe on him. Will be reconciled unto God. And he has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Look at verse 19. In verse 19, to wit, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. That's why he takes away the guilt. Takes away the condemnation. Takes away the punishment. And he has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. In verse 20, verse 20 tells us, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you, we plead with you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Reconcile yourself unto God. You know, good works will not reconcile you to God. Even if you can live by yourself like an angel from now till you die. Why? All the sins you committed in the past, they're still on record with God. Those sins of your past, even if it is only one sin you have committed since you were born, that single sin makes you an enemy of the Holy God. It's on record that you are a sinner because of the sins of the past. Turn over a new leaf. Those sins are still there. Do the best you can. Those past sins are still there. Give all your money to feed the poor. That past sin is still there. And be as nice as an angel every day between now until you die. That past sin that makes you an enemy of God is still there. That has to be settled. You need to reconcile with God. You need to come through Jesus Christ. And it is that Jesus Christ is God, is man, son of God, son of man. He holds the hand of God. He holds the hand of the sinful man and brings it together. He is the only one that can reconcile you unto God. And when you are reconciled unto God, you will not continue in the sins of the past that made him angry against you. 
you did something bad, something wrong. God says, I condemn that. I will punish you for that. I will judge that. And you know that thing that made him angry? That puts you under the load of judgment and perdition. Now you are reconciled with God through Jesus Christ. And you go back to that same evil, sinful thing. Think about it yourself. What separated you from God and you are reconciled and you go back to that again? You are separated from God. God does not change. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're reading from verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators. You know, I, some people encountered me, I encountered some people. And they say, you know, Pastor, can we talk to you? I say, please go ahead. I'm all ears. I want to listen to you. They say in the modern world, public speakers do not mention fornication, adultery in the public. I said, well, I'm not preaching like the public. I'm reading the Bible. I'm preaching the Bible. They don't mention fornication, adultery, that is so common in every land, that is so sinful in every land. That's them. Let them be who they are. I am a Bible believer, a Bible preacher. They say if you mention fornication, adultery in the public, all decent people, they are decent, they commit adultery in the private, they are decent and they commit fornication and they do evil in the private. How decent are they? They say if you mention those things in the public, decent people will not come to hear you again. If they don't hear, they'll perish. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, no thieves, no covetous, no drunkard, no revilers, no extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Sinners who do not repent, sinners who continue in sin, they go to church, they continue in sin. They even preach the Bible, they continue in sin. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. Then in verse 11, it says, and such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Look at number two. Number two, we're talking about the restoration and the gracious transformation of backsliders. Backsliders are the people that slide back. Uh, they may not go back by a single jump. 
but they slide, they slide, they slide back. Little by little, deception comes in. Little by little, hypocrisy comes in. Little by little, uh, covering up comes in. Little by little, the vomit they are giving up, they begin to swallow their vomit again. Backsliders are the people that slide back away from God. And what the backslider needs is to have restoration. And, and sometimes a backslider can remain in a high position. Like David, the king of Israel. He was still king. He kept his position. He was still making judgment and commandment. Giving orders that man that did that will die. Until Nathan said, Thou art the man. There are not many Nathans in the pulpit today. They respect highly placed people. They respect Father in the Lord, Mother in the Lord. And when they are backsliding, the preachers, the Nathans of today, they cannot talk. But if backsliders are going to return, somebody must rise up and tell them you are sliding back. And so when Nathan confronted David, he said in Psalm 51 verse 1, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. That's how a backslider prays. Doesn't say, I'm saved, I'm saved forever. Whatever I do, wherever I go, I'm still a child of God. A backslider should not pay, pray that way. Have mercy upon me, O God. According to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy mercies, it says, blot out my transgressions. Look at verse 2. In verse 2 it says, Wash me thoroughly. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Somebody who was saved, born again, but he went back into sin. And he's covering the sin by laughing. That's not real. He's covering the sin by smiling. That's plastic. That's not real. When you have gone back to sin, you must have sorrow. You have condemnation. You have, uh, you lose assurance of getting to heaven. What's the joy when you don't have Jesus? What's the joy when your name is out of the book of life? What's the joy when you're under condemnation of sinning? To have real joy, good joy, heavenly joy. You rejoice because your names are reaching in heaven. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Look at number three here. 
Number three, the repentance and gracious transformation of a city. An individual can repent. A family can repent and turn unto the Lord. A whole city can repent and turn unto the Lord. We're looking at Jonah chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 1. Jonah chapter 3 verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time saying. In verse 2. Arise and go into Nineveh that great city. And preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Jonah had a command. Jonah had a commission. Jonah had a definite thing to do in Nineveh. It wasn't motivating them. It wasn't encouraging them. It wasn't exciting them. It wasn't playing with them. It wasn't talking and singing. I pity those preachers. Maybe in deeper life. Those sinners are there. Those backsliders are there. And they come to preach. And as they mention something that they feel will hurt the people will make the sinners unhappy. So they want to excite them. They want to entertain them. And they begin singing, singing. And the conviction that came upon sinners, all that will vanish away. They want to speak a good word. That was not the commission of Jonah. That was not the commandment of Jonah. He said, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. In verse 3, in verse 3, so Jonah arose and he went unto Nineveh. According to the word of the Lord, now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, and Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He didn't tone down the watch of God for Nineveh. He was afraid of them. But against the fear of those sinners in Nineveh, courageously he told them, Yet forty days, and the sinners in, in uh, Nineveh, and the whole of Nineveh, because there wasn't a single converted soul there, Nineveh will be overthrown. Look at verse 5. And in verse 5, so the people of Nineveh believed God. They didn't believe for healing. They believe judgment will come. They were not believing for, you know, be happy and be joyful. They were believing that 40 days their sin had gone to the ceiling and to the highest level. Nineveh will be overthrown. And they proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth 
from the greatest of them even to the least of them the greatest the highest and the person that had position we can repent to the least the poor the impoverished we can repent to and then we're told in verse 6 in verse 6 for the word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him he put his robe of authority his robe of royalty put that away judgment is coming no one will be spared he was king he realized that how many highly placed people today want the preacher to come and preach their own separate watered down message to them after I've spoken to everybody the king did not say call that preacher call that journal I hear what you've told everybody but me <laughs> look at my palace look at my surrounding now tell me the message look around first see all my servants see all my security see all that I have now preach to me there's no other message my friend the soul that sinners it shall die the only way anyone can be saved is to look at your life no matter who you are to turn and to repent and to believe the word of the Lord but the king laid his robe aside and he covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes look at verse 7 in verse 7 it says now and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles saying let neither man nor beast herd nor flock taste anything and let them not feed nor drink water look at verse 8 in verse 8 it says and let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God yeah let them turn let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands the king himself repented and all his people counselors minister they saw judgment is coming they repented And he told the populace the violence is in your hand, the sin in your hand, the transgression in your hand, turn. Look at verse. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, and God saw their works. He saw their change. He saw the turning of their mind. They were not angry at uh, Jonah. We live in a world where when you preach the truth of the word of God, repentance for every man and every woman. 
that those who hear, they look at the preacher, safe who are you, to talk of repentance in our presence. And they don't want to change, they don't want to repent, they are angry at the preacher. It says God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and he did it not. In the repentance of a whole city and reconciliation came between them and God. Restoration calls for the people that turn from their evil way. We're coming to point number two. In point number two, the godly travelers with growing thirst. Godly travelers that have thirst for God passion for God. They are not hungry for the things of this world. They are not passionate for the things of this world. They are passionate, they are hungry, they are thirsty for the things of God. There are three things we are looking at here. Number one, the good thirst of pilgrims for God and godliness. When we're born again and we're traveling to heaven, there's only one passion, only really one thirst in our heart. I want to get to heaven. I want to make the rapture. I don't want to be left behind in this world. One thing they're thirsty about, and you see, good thirst they have before the Lord. Number two, growing thoughtfulness and passion for glory. They are thoughtful in the choices they make in life. They will not choose anything that will take heaven away from their hand. They are thoughtful about their action, about their utterance. They don't want to say anything or go any direction that will cancel their opportunity of getting to heaven. They are not people who do things without thinking. They are not people who go where they have not thought through about. There are no people that live from day to day without thinking of the consequence of their action. And the more we grow in the Lord, the more thoughtful we are. The growing thoughtfulness and passion for glory. Number three, the great thoughts and plans of God for the godly. Look at number one, the good thirst of pilgrims for God and godliness. It tells us in, uh, in Psalm 63 verse 1. Psalm 63 verse 1, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee, my soul thirsteth for thee. My soul thirsted for thee, not, not for the corrupted gold of the world, not for the fallen nature of man, and not for anything that will feed the flesh and stab the soul. My soul thirsted for thee, my flesh longeth for thee. 
in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. And then he tells us in verse 2. He says, to see thy power and thy glory. So as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. That's what you are hungry for. That's what, what you are thirsty for. And in Matthew chapter 5 verse 6. It says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. The people that thirst and hunger after righteousness. For they shall be filled. We're coming to number two. Number two is the growing thoughtfulness and passion for glory. The growing thoughtfulness. You're thinking. I'm thinking today of my glorious hope. I'm thinking today of when Christ will come. I'm thinking today of the glory that shall follow at the rapture. Do you think of that? In your action, your lifestyle, in your utterance, in your behavior, in your prayer, you think of when the Lord will come. If you are a real child of God, every day draws you closer and closer to heaven. If you are a true child of God, Every day prolongs, every day increases the distance between you and the world. And the word of God tells us in Philippians chapter 4. It tells us in verse 5. Let your moderation be known unto all men. Are you moderate now? As you were many years ago when you were born again, your aspiration, your ambition, the drive in you that wants you, you want to have more signs of this world. You want to dress like the people of the world. Are you moderate in dressing? Are you moderate in your character? Are you moderate in your interaction with the people of the world? Was you as careless as you were before you were born again? Any check on your utterance? Any moderation in your behavior? Are you walking and talking like a person who wants to get to heaven? In your wedding ceremony, have you not gone totally back to the world? The appearance at the wedding. And then immediately you take the video, you are showing it all over the world. They must know I am getting married. And then you contact many people. If you cannot travel, this is the, you know, what you are going to put there. You see me on uh, Facebook. You see me, uh, you know, on the, uh, you see me on the YouTube. Everywhere your wedding, your, your wedding is competing with the transmission of the message of Christ. Because everybody must know. Even those who don't know about the death of Christ, about the resurrection of Christ, they must know about this wedding how moderate is that we're doing burial funeral ceremony and the people didn't know my mother when she was alive 
they must know that my mother is very important to me i will broadcast it everywhere my friend why don't you broadcast jesus christ the savior everywhere like that why are you so fanatical about this burial when Christ died 2,000 years ago? Even your next door neighbor, you didn't tell your next door neighbor that Christ died for them to save them. And everybody must hear. You, you say it in the language of the country. You bring interpreter from another country. And you translate, you transmit and translate to many languages because I'm burying my mother. My friend, where is your moderation? Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. In verse 7. Verse 7 says, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Verse 8 tells us, It says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things no evil thing in this list no evil relationship in this list no sinful practice in this list don't think about those other things the things that are good and righteous and holy and pure this is your area of thoughtfulness Look at number three. Number three, we're looking at the great thoughts and plans of God for the godly. The great thoughts of God and the plans of God for the godly. Jeremiah 29 verse 11. In Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11, for I know the thoughts that I think uh, toward you. What thought is God thinking about me? That I get to heaven after I live these many years on earth. What thought is God thinking about me? That Calvary will not be in vain in my life. What thought is God thinking about me? Is he to promote me to the highest level on earth and to get me to the lowest level in hell? No, he wants me to moderately enjoy what I have on earth and at the last to get to heaven. And you must match your thoughts with the thoughts of God. Match your plans with the plans of God. 
For I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. And to give you an expected end. To give you an expected end. When the children of Israel left Egypt, what was God's expected end for them? To get to the promised land. When the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea, what was the expected end of God for them? For them to get to the land of promise. When they drank water out of their rock, what was the expected end of God for them? To cross over Jordan and get to the promised land. After he saved us, after he healed us, after he works miracle in our lives, what's the expected end he has for us? to get over there at last we must match our thoughts with the thoughts of God we must match our plans with the plans of God we we'll come to point number three now point number three is the glorious translation before the great tribulation Look at Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5. By faith Enoch was translated. By faith Enoch was translated. When? Before the flood. He was translated in Genesis chapter 5. The flood was announced in Genesis chapter 6. That flood swept everybody away. But Enoch was translated before that great tribulation of their time. When did, he, when did Noah enter into the ark? Before the flood and the deluge swept everybody away. Noah and his family, because they found grace in the sight of God, they entered into the ark before the flood really came out to sweep everybody away into a sorrowful eternity. When are we going to be translated? Before the great tribulation. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. The translation, the rapture, is to make us not to see death. The dead in Christ will rise. And we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them without seeing death. He was translated and he was not found. When the rapture happens and the Lord takes the believers away from the bus, from the aeroplane, from the sheep, from the farm, from the city, the believers will be taken away. And the people of the world, our neighbors, will be knocking on our door. Where is Mr. So and so? Where is Mrs. So and so? Where is this and where is that? We will not be found. We would have gone up. 
Maybe it's, you know, some of these people here, then you're trying to call somebody you know in any country of the world. You want to be sure wherever you're making a mistake, you have not found this and that, you call them, their phone will not answer, they have gone and they left their phone behind for you to do what you want to do with it. Because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Those who are displeasing God in their behavior, their character, they will not be taken at the time of that rapture. Those who are displeasing God in their doctrine, twisting the Bible, placing the Bible upside down. Those who are displeasing God in their preaching, who justify the sinful and the unbelieving. Those who are displeasing God, they will not go in the rapture. Those who favor the unrighteous so that they will be able to get something from them and they are smiling on the, at the unrighteous and they depreciate and they put down the belittle. The righteous people, they are not pleasing God, they will not go at the time of the rapture. For people like Enoch that please God in all things at all times, whatever the cost. Whatever the persecution, whatever the frowns of men or the frowns of women. They made up their mind they are going to please the Lord. Come, watch me. Suffer whatever betides. They please God. Those are the people that were translated before the great tribulation here on earth. Look at three things here. Number one, the glorious translation for the transformed. Number two, the great tribulation for transgressors. Number three, the glowing trophy for the triumphant. Look at number one. Number one, the glorious translation for the transformed. Look at that again. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5. By faith Enoch was translated. That he should not see death. What does it mean to be the lonely, righteous person among 100,000 people? In the market, unrighteousness. On the street, unrighteousness. Everywhere Enoch went, everybody disagreed with him. Or righteousness filled everywhere. This man who can be alone without feeling lonely. This man who can stand, stand for righteousness without feeling the loneliness that everybody around was righteous. That is what it takes to make it on the final day. For those to have the glorious translation. Because their lives are so transformed. 
and there is no shade or shadow of compromise in their lives. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and he was not found. <laughs> they couldn't find him in the night club. You don't find rapturable people there. You can't find them there. You don't uh, find, uh, you know, such people in those places of sinfulness. It was not found because God had translated him. For before the translation, he had a testimony that consistently and constantly and firmly and uncompromisingly he pleased God. Look at number two. Number two is the great tribulation for the transgressors. There's going to be a great tribulation after the rapture. All church people who are not really saved, they'll be in that great tribulation. All deep alive by name, who are shallow alive by life. They'll be in that great tribulation. All the holy, holy people who are holy in the public, but they are unholy, they are sinful, they are defiled, they are backsliding, they are fleshly. In the secret, they will go through that great tribulation. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 21. But then shall be great tribulation. Such as was not since the, since the beginning of the world. To this time, no, nor ever shall be. The time of the great tribulation is the time of great suffering. And there will be many, many surprises. When Christ comes and he takes the Enoch's away. And all the other people that play with sin, gamble with their souls, they are left here on the earth. There shall be great tribulation. As had never happened in the world before. No, nor ever shall be. Look at number three here. Number three. Number three. The growing, the glowing trophy for the triumphant. The people that will wear the crown of life. The people that will wear the crown of the conqueror. The people will be triumphant. And because they are triumphant, that's why they will go in the rapture. And from the glorious translation, they will come to the glorious triumph. And their crowns will glow and glow and glow forever. In 2 Timothy chapter 4. Reading from verse 7. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7. It says, I have fought a good fight. That man was born again. And the flesh tried to pull him back to where he was. He fought his flesh. He fought against anything that will take him back to the defilement of the world. I have fought a good fight. 
religious Pharisees and Sadducees, they tried to challenge him. Paul, are you not a Pharisee? Were you not born by Pharisees? Did you not contain for this ideology of the Pharisees before you were born again? They tried to bring him back. He fought with courage. He fought with conviction. I have fought a good fight. Even people who had become believers before Paul became a believer. Look at Peter. He was eating with the Gentiles. He knew that the wall of partition had been broken down. And so yet were the Gentiles. And when the Jews came, and Peter saw them, senior apostle, he went back. He was afraid of those Jewish people. And Paul stood up and said, Simon Peter, what are you doing? He fought against compromise. You see, if you're going to make it on the final day, you will not allow an iota of compromise to come into your life. And it's the people who can fight sin, fight corruption, fight compromise. Anywhere you are, in any country where you are, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. He knew what was said before him. He said, others are doing theirs, I'm doing mine. He was to establish the faith in Christ everywhere. That's what the cause was brought to. He was to establish sanctification and holiness everywhere. That was the cause he was called for. The wind blew. The situations turned. And the pressure came. And the fighters against holiness came to him. But he said, I continued, I continued until I finished my course. And then he said, I have kept the faith. When did this face of the Bible and face of the word, when did it come to you in your country? The overseers that have been sent here, the overseers that have been working with you, these years the faith came into your country. Have they not emphasized the faith in Jesus, the only Savior? Have they not emphasized transforming salvation? Have they not emphasized sanctification with holiness of heart? That's the faith that came to you. Have you kept that faith? Have you kept that faith in your personal life, in your family, in the local churches, in the national church, in deeper life, anywhere you find deeper life? Have we kept the church deeper? Have we kept the families deeper? Have, have we kept all the branches deeper? Deeper Christian life, life, life ministry. 
have we kept our lives in the public our lives in public office our lives in the of private have we kept it deeper I have fought a good fight. I am still here. I'm still fighting the good fight. I have finished my course. I'm on the way to finishing my course. I have kept the faith. It is grace by stress. Wading through the stormy sea everywhere. I've endeavored to keep on keeping the faith. How about you? Not talk of mouth in reality. Look, look, look at verse 8. In verse 8, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. That's a trophy. That's the reward. It says, henceforth. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. He was sure of glory before he died. There are some people, so called believers, on their deathbed, they're wondering, Where will I end up? Where will I go? The remembrance of their past life, of their past testimony, everything comes back to them. They're wondering, Where? Will I be? For Paul, there was no doubt. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but for all them also that love is appearing. The Lord is coming. The next thing we're watching for now, we're looking for now, is the rapture of the church. After we're gone, there'll be the great tribulation on the earth. I pray you'll not go through the great tribulation. But when the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are alive shall be caught up together with them, you'll be caught up. You will go up from grace through godliness to glory. Amen. 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 Blue four. Let's let's rise up and pray. Take the message of the Lord in prayer. Accept the message He has given by His Spirit. Don't judge the message. Receive the message. Don't you criticize the message. Believe the message. Act the way you ought to act in response to this message if you truly believe.